Okay, so everybody, we're being recorded. All right. So welcome to um, Don Debar, Dan Kovalik. Um, you've both been uh, uh, participants accompanying the recent elections in the Russian Federation, which resulted in a triumph, a personal triumph and a political triumph for uh, President Vladimir Putin. Um, we hope you'll be able to talk to us about uh, the election process itself and also related issues. Um, so to start off with, how, how did you both feel about the sense you got from the polls and uh, uh, just being in the country at, uh, at election time um, that they reflected a free and fair final result? Could you talk to us a bit about that issue? Well, yeah. Um, you know, first of all, you know, it's always I just want to say, uh, you know, it's very hard to make broad sweeping generalizations of, of the election because we obviously only saw little little pieces of it. So but from what I saw and I, by the way, was in Kherson Oblast, which for those who don't know where that is and the, it's significant, Kherson Oblast up to um September of 2022 was part of Ukraine. It is now at least roughly half of it is now part of Russia. It's now divided along the Dnieper River between Russia and Ukraine. Um, so I was on the Russia side and we flew into Crimea and then drove up the land bridge, the natural land bridge that's always been there to get to Kherson Oblast, which is very important to understand that this was always the route between uh, Russia, uh, that part of Ukraine and Crimea, uh, before the Kerch Bridge was built, the, the infamous Kerch Bridge, which has been uh, attacked on a couple of occasions. Um, so uh, what I was, you know, interested to see is one that they were able to conduct these in-person elections in a in a conflict zone because it's still a fairly hot region between Russia and Ukraine. In fact, there were a couple polling places attacked by Ukraine during the election. Again, closer to the Dnieper River, which we were not that close to there. Um, but we, in addition, we tried to drive to another polling place. Uh, which was four hours from where we were at, which shows how big the Oblast is. Um, and we were turned back because a mine was found laid inside the polling place under a ballot box. Again, presumably by agents of Ukraine. So, but aside from those few incidents, it was a relatively peaceful and tranquil voting process. People that I saw seemed excited to vote. They even had a little festival outside the main polling place in the city where we were in that went on for three days. Um, and uh, a large percentage of the electorate voted. In fact, I think over 50% had already voted in early voting. So um, my perception was that people were happy to be back part of Russia. Harrison Oblast had been part of Russia going back to Catherine, Catherine the Great in the 1800s. Um, and um, was only for a relatively short period of time um, part of, of, of Ukraine. So in any case, um, people seemed happy to be back part of Russia and to be able to vote in the elections. And again, they resoundingly voted for Vladimir Putin. My party came in second with under 5% of the vote, and that's the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. So we were glad they at least got second. But in any case, there you go. I hope okay. that helps. Yeah, thanks, Don and Dan, uh, for giving us the sort of report back. Don, why don't you tell us a bit about well, your criteria, where you were, and what you saw. Yeah, so originally I was going to be, uh, I was told I was going to be working in Moscow. Um, 
I, a friend was also on the delegation in Moscow, was hoping to hook up with her, planned to celebrate her birthday on the 17th in Moscow, et cetera. And as soon as I got off the plane, uh, I found out, in fact, I was headed to Siberia. I was told I'm going to Siberia. <laughs> and I was kind of marveling at this because it usually takes me two or three days to get into that much trouble when I come to a new city. And this was right away before I got off the plane, practically. Um, I went to a uh, city called Krasnoyarsk. Uh, it's dead center in Siberia, if you look at it on a map. Uh, has a population of about 1.2 million people. Uh, there are a number of universities, uh, technical institutes, including a, the Gastronomic Institute, which is uh, sort of the Russian version of the uh, uh, Culinary Institute of America. Um, very, very vibrant cultural life. Uh, people are living not huddled in the corner of Siberia, uh, but rather out in the streets. Uh, brand new apartment blocks all over, like you see all over China and Moscow and other places. And um, I was uh, taken by the fact that it was a very festive atmosphere when we got there. I saw this also, by the way, evident in Moscow when I arrived and uh, after I went back to Moscow before I went home, that the people were very involved in the in the election um, and uh, that. They, it seemed that, uh, you know, they, I mean, you have to consider the fact that they are at war on their border uh, with the United States. And that they, the people there know that they're being attacked, even if the people of the United States don't know that we're attacking them. And even among the candidates, there, there were three other candidates on the ballot. And I, I'd like to make sure we touch on that, particularly the process. But, um, the three other candidates, uh, they held a joint press conference after the election was over. And there was much more of a commonality on the things that the country's facing right now than even in terms of policy uh, than there was a disagreement among the four. I, I did a lot of interviews when I was there. I don't know what the hell that was about. but um, And something that occurred to me in one of the first ones that I did uh, is that, you know, if you are a um, wannabe authoritarian, you know, president for life or whatever, uh, and you are unfortunately for that ambition stuck inside, uh, you know, operating democratic forms, it's very easy to stay in office forever. Do a really, really, really good job so that people want to keep you in that office. And if you look at the recent history of Russia from 1998-99, uh, when uh, Boris Yeltsin finally left the scene and the American advisors like Jeffrey Sachs and others were given the boot and Rosneft and uh, Gazprom and the other large uh, industrial concerns uh, were reacquired by the state after having been looted and the uh, uh, average uh, lifespan uh, that had slid down to the mid 50s for uh, men uh, started to climb back up to the uh, 70s and things started to work and people started to prosper. When people go into a voting booth, they understand what they're doing. And so it's not a surprise that A, you would have turnout of 75 to 80 percent during wartime and B, that the bulk of the vote would go to the person that the people think is responsible for the change in their condition. And there was a strong sense of that everywhere. I spoke with a lot of people unscript. I'm, I'm not like a hang out on a tour bus and, you know, let people leave me around by the nose kind of guy. When I go someplace, I've traveled the world some, and, and I like to go into a town very often by myself and stumble around through the bars and restaurants and streets and things and just meet people in the daily pursuit of their, you know, their daily life and try to get a sense of who they are, what they think, how they feel and all of that. And I got a good sense from that modality that the people felt ownership of this election um, and they felt that they had an important task ahead of them to make sure that they are well protected in this war. Uh, that the uh, gains that they've achieved, uh, you know, continue to accrue. So th the image that 
is being perpetrated in the United States. I don't know what else is going on, like where you guys are, um, it, of uh, people being practically escorted at gunpoint to the polls to make sure the turnout was high, that the people were being harassed at work and all this other crap that's coming out of uh, Voice of America and the uh, simps like the New York Times and Washington Post. Um, it was nothing like that whatsoever. One other thing. So what we were doing there as election observers is a part of a scientific study, okay? It's random. It's not 100% coverage. It's, you know, a sampling of, of the coverage. So we went to, I think I went to uh, seven, you know, seven, eight, and seven polling places, first day, second day, third day. And on the top, you enter your name, you enter the date and time you were there. So I'm there March 15th, 9.35 to 10.05. This is my sample. What did you see? Did you see anybody jump in the turnstiles? Did you see anybody stuff in the ballot box? Did you see anybody bullying anybody? Did you see anybody not have their questions answered, et cetera, et cetera? Page and a half of that kind of questions. And then about the behavior, the actual behavior in my interactions with the people working at the polls and the poll itself. Was the poll uh, open and easy to get into? Did it seem inviting or foreboding? This kind of stuff. So, you know, for me, they got, let's well, say uh, 721. So about maybe uh, 10 hours worth of testimony. This is what I saw over three days for these 10 hours. And we had 700 and some odd members, I think, of, of the delegation. And so that's the sample that they got. In addition to that, however, and we saw this in the in the uh, uh, across uh, the headquarters of the uh, elect, election uh, apparatus, the Board of Elections, for lack of a better term. Um, and and this was in all of the uh, stations and on the internet. Every polling place in the country had the public areas under uh, surve uh, video surveillance. And they had people watching this, like at the local or regional level, and also anyone could watch it on the internet, and it's archived. So, for example, there were some kids or, or troublemakers that were trying to uh, interrupt the vote in a couple of places, two or three places that I heard of, where they took ink capsules or whatever, and threw it into where the ballots were in the bottom of the machines. I'll explain that in a minute. And so they were arrested. They were trying to ruin the ballots and interrupt the voting that way. They were arrested. These people said, this is what we saw them do. The police came. And then they call up the archives, polling place number 306, 905 on Saturday. Bam, there's the video of it. Anything, any misdeed that anybody committed anywhere, any allegation of a misdeed in, in the public areas is recorded. We don't have anything like that. Operationally, here's what you do. You walk up to a polling place. There's big signs. There's a big, there's a logo with a white, blue, and red, you know, the colors of the flag. And it's like my, uh, when the hell did I put my hat? Like this hat that I, that I got. Um, and, uh, they, um, they walk into, it's a library or it's a school or it's some other public building. Um, you go in through what the security there. It's not, they're not scary security, but you feel safe. I'm not worried that somebody's going to blow up the polling place. They're, it looks protected. And then it's like it is in the United States right here in Austin. There's a long table uh, with a bunch of retired grandmothers, mostly, uh, sitting at the table jabbering at each other all day long they have a great this is like one of the big social activities of the year and and they're professionals this is this is the thing that they do so you walk up to them my name begins with d i walk over it says d to f uh, i tell them my name they look me up yes you're a registered voter here's your ballot you go into a little half a booth you mark the ballot they go in come out of the little booth at where it's, you know, you have a curtain behind you and you put it on top of a scanner. It goes into the scanner, registers the vote, and then drops the ballot into the bottom of the machine. So then I got 
the opportunity to, I was the governor of the region was at the first place I went to. And so I did a little Q and A with him and he was very generous with his time and information. So I said, okay, what happens with the paper ballots? And first of all, what's the, what, what count do you guys use? Are you going to do a hand count? He said, no, we use a machine count unless it's challenged or there's some evidence of, you know, uh, operation problem or whatever. And we preserve the paper ballots and um, and keep them in custody so that if we need to verify the machine count, we can do that very easily. We do this across the country. That That's pretty much what they do here, except, oh, and the other thing was, in terms of um, absentee ballots, which was a big issue here in the 2020 election, uh, where they were mailing out ballots to people in numbers that had never been done before because of COVID supposedly, um, and uh, where the uh, ballots were out of the custody of the Board of Elections from the time they dropped it in the mailbox to send to the voter until the time it came back into the Board of Elections, either by mailbox or by collection boxes or whatever. So I asked, I said, is this, you know, this is a problem in terms of custody. This, it's a wide open opportunity for fraud, ballot stuffing and all of that. They said it's impossible here. We never uh, lose uh, custody of the ballot. We take the ballot to the voter and let them fill it out. And then we take it back. A, an election official with an observer. Much different than the United States. Final thing has to do with how you get on the ballot. In the United States, you want to run for president, you have to get on 50 ballots. Places like New York, you need 40,000 and 50,000 signatures, meaning good signatures that are, are accurate as to the identity of the voter, the date they signed, their address corresponds to the address in the, in the rolls of the uh, Board of Elections uh, and other procedural you know, minutia. Um, People are knocked off the ballot all the time here because of hyper enforcement of those things, even where they're not really material. Um, and so, you know, but getting 50 of those, you're talking somewhere, I think it was two or three or 400,000 signatures that you need at a minimum in order to get on the ballot for president here. In Russia, you need 100,000 signatures to get on the ballot. They can come from anywhere inside the country. And the, uh, there's a, a review process for it if, if uh, there's a determination that you didn't reach the threshold. And so that was one thing. It's actually easier to get on the ballot in Russia than it is to get on the ballot here. I would like to discuss this with Bobby Kennedy, particularly, and uh, Donald Trump, looking at the efforts to keep them off the ballot here, even though Kennedy has a 25 to 35 percent favorability and Trump has more than 40 and, and almost 50 favorability that they don't seem to, to care here about giving the voters their choice, but rather procedural stuff. The two people in Russia that were knocked off the ballot that have been championed by like the Atlantic Council and the NED or whatever, um, Navalny uh, and uh, another guy, I forgot his name, but he's a, they called him the peace candidate because he wants Russia to, to come out, pull out of uh, Ukraine and out of the new territories. Um, between them never had 20% of uh, popularity. And yet, uh, and one of them is off because he had felony convictions, which you can't run for office here in most states either with felony conviction. And the other one submitted 105,000 signatures. And when they were challenged, it ended up being about 86,000, which is normal, by the way. When you go to petition in New York, if you need 1,000 signatures, you get 2,000 signatures and you sweat a little bit, hoping that you know enough of them will stand after they're challenged. This, this stuff, what happened there is normal, final. When you vote for president in Russia, that candidate gets your vote. In the United States, that's not what happens. In the United States, you vote for an intermediary called an elector. And then they, a month later, meet and vote on who's gonna be president. In some states, that person is legally bound to vote for the person that they said they would vote for, although it's not criminal for them to do to change their mind. This is the unfaithful electors and et cetera that you've heard about. Uh, the other is that um, in, in many states, and it, this is always interesting to 
used in the context of law and politics, they only have a moral obligation to vote for the person that they said they would vote for. That's how you vote for president in the United States, as opposed to pulling a lever for one of the four candidates in Russia. So that's what I've observed. Stephen, you have to unmute yourself. So thank you, Dan and Don, for giving us that um, summary of your uh, fascinating experiences during that, that Russian election process. Very instructive for, uh, for people who are not familiar with it. And also thank you, Don, for giving us some comparisons to the system in the United States. So Dan, um, am I, or, uh, uh, is it all right to ask you how you view the significance of uh, President Vladimir Putin's remarkable triumph in that election, what it may mean in terms of Russia's domestic and, and foreign affairs development, um, uh, 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 and, and, and also in terms of how you see Russia uh, proceeding with what now, uh, I think, um, Mr. Peskov, the spokesperson for the Russian presidency, has admitted has turned into a war rather than a special military operation. Yes, well, I mean, first of all, I think the election in the end was a referendum on Putin and his performance and a referendum on the spe special military operations or wars, you, you know, want to call it, in Ukraine. Yeah. And clearly the people are behind Putin. Um, on the war um, and on the economy, which again, he's done a great job in weathering these, what, 1600 sanctions or so that the West has put on Russia. Um, so I would say that he has the mandate to keep going forward in the war and on the economic policies that he has pursued. And I think he will continue to move forward. I think he will especially after the terrorist attack that happened over the weekend, I think that he will pursue the war even more aggressively. And he will do so also because of NATO's threats, especially France's threats to send troops to fight in Ukraine. So, I mean, I think now there's no turning back for Russia is the truth of it. I think, I think that they will dispatch with Ukraine in a way that they've been reluctant to do. Um, and again, I think, especially after the terrorist attacks, Putin will have full reign to do that. I want to note a couple things about Ukraine and Russia because, so you, as a background to what I'm going to say, you saw that the State Department officially threatened the international observers, right, with unspecified reprisals. They said we were going to be held accountable with all the tools at the disposal of the United States government. And in fact, when I got off my plane in Chicago from Istanbul, um, uh, we were told by the pilot to have our passports ready as we e exited the plane. And they were looking at the um, passports as I was leaving and people were just going by. But then when they got to my passport, they said, sir, will you come with us? And so clearly the whole thing was done but to get me. And I was brought back and interrogated about my trip to Russia. But the statement made, and Don just put this up in the chat, the statement made by Matt Miller from the Secretary, uh, from the Secretary of State's office was that in particular, they were upset with the international observers like myself, who were in the new regions of Russia, which were part of Ukraine till recently, because the claim was that we were in, uh, impacting uh, Ukrainian sovereignty by being an observer for this sham election, is, is again, the U.S. has called it. But let me say, so that's a long way to give background on what I'm going to say. A few things need to be said. First of all, I don't think it was a sham election, but whatever kind of election it was, at least Russia's having elections, right? Zelensky has announced Ukraine won't have elections till further notice, okay? But the U.S. doesn't care about that. 
In addition, the Communist Party uh, ran candidates, um, you know, in these elections, and um, the Communist Party has been outlawed in Ukraine. Right. So Zelensky has been outlawing parties, throwing opposition candidates in jail. But again, the U.S. doesn't care about that. The other thing that's interesting in in the hair son Oblast was that so you have to show a form of identification to vote. And usually the passport is shown. It was acceptable to show either a Ukrainian or Russian passport. People were not discriminated against by what passport they happen to be holding. So that, which I think these are all just things important to say. Um, it's also important to note the fact that the Communist Party did have a candidate that ran and came in second in the election. We will not be, we do not have the option of voting for a socialist president in our elections, right? Um, and so the, the choices that he actually had for president were much more diverse in terms of ideology and whatnot, uh, which all need to be pointed out. But in any case, I think what you saw in the election, the overwhelming support for Putin, which he got something like, what, 87, 88 percent of the vote with 77 percent of the people voting, it shows, again, it was a referendum, not only on his leadership, but I think on the unity of Russia. Russia's behind him, and Russia is united. And I think that the West is now facing an even stronger adversary after these elections and after this terrorist attack, I think, which will be, will backfire greatly on those who did it. And I believe the West was behind it. And I think Ukraine was behind it. And I think, you know, um, there will be a reckoning for that. Let's just put it that way. So. Hey, John, and what's your take? Hello. Hi, John, what's your take? Oh, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, first of all, the uh, the outcome of the election is that uh, it, the election was certainly a referendum on a number of things. First of all, you know, the, one of the biggest criticisms of uh, President Putin is that he's running yet again and that both by, you know, working the system, but with uh, an interim uh, president, uh, Medvedev, to allow him to, you know, run again, uh, and also by uh, cha having changes made to the to the law to allow him to stay, uh, that uh, he was allowed to stay. That that part is true. That's a mechanical process by which it happened. Um, however, this then results in a poll that lasts three days, and uh, more than three quarters of the population turns out, and he uh, wins. Um, by 87, 88% of the vote. Um, it's a referendum on him and on the legitimacy of his presidency, I think, first of all, and on the job that he's done up to this point. And it's obviously also a referendum on the war and on the conduct of the war. And that means that the strategy that the U.S. has attempted to employ, which is a multi-dimensional you know, war, whatever the hell the term they use for it now is, um, where they would tighten the uh, economic uh, screws and send home uh, Russians in body bags and create discontent among the Russian people and then stir up a color revolution or some analogous you know, uprising that would take down the Russian state that is going to fail because at this moment in time, after all of their previous attempts, the position of the Russian state and the position of President Putin has never been stronger with a full voicing from the people on this point. So it seemed, you know, not even coincidental uh, that within days after this, you know, voicing was expressed that you would have a horrific terror attack inside of Moscow. This is their stock and trade down in Langley, as we know. Uh, and the Russian people are behind the government again on this. 
And so I don't know what the game is going to be in terms of whether they're going to double down and try additional, uh, you know, incidents like this. We heard from uh, Vicky Newland on her way out that uh, Putin's going to get some surprises. <laughs> Why she's not in the dock just over that statement it just it amazes me. So may, maybe there will be more attempts. We saw that they uh, tried to do a barrage on Crimea uh, yesterday or today, Saturday or Sunday, uh, the, the 23rd or 24th. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, all in all, the country has proven that it's uh, economically resilient, uh, militarily competent, and uh, the government enjoys the full support of the people. I don't know if you're going to have to conduct a war of self-defense I don't know how you walk into that condition uh, in a uh, stronger position than it seems to be in. Hi, Camilla. Have you got any um, any questions to, to Dan and Juan? Yeah, so I think Don started to answer um, one of my questions, and so I'll, I'll see if Dan has anything to add. In Latin America, we've seen you know, the use of NGOs basically year round on a permanent basis, and they play a central role now here in our region um, in trying to work to influence the politics of a country, as well as specifically influencing elections. And clearly in the case of Russia, um, and assuming that they did their best to try to uh, affect this electoral process, they've not accomplished what they set out to do. So what have you seen as the role of those uh, sort of NGOs in uh, Russia, and what sort of actions has the government taken against that to protect the country from this foreign meddling? Yeah, well, Russia has over the years, Putin has definitely cracked down on a lot of these NGOs, kicked some out, for example, because, yeah, they have played a role in um, trying to stir up anti-government um, sentiment and actions. In this case, the U.S. tried to encourage NGOs under its influence to abstain from the election and to encourage people to abstain from the election. The U.S.'s goal and the West's goal, they knew Putin would win, but they really wanted to try to suppress the vote, to try to claim, therefore, that it really wasn't a referendum because there was low voter turnout. Of course, that failed miserably. Again, he had something like 77% voter turnout, which is extraordinary and makes you our presidential and other elections look anemic uh, by comparison, of course. Um, so, but I do think that Putin has really taken more aggressive stance against these NGOs, again, particularly after the special military operations began, and my guess is he will continue to be more aggressive against them. Um, because they play a very treacherous role in, in, in societies uh, like that of Russia. Um, and they're very seductive for people to work for because they can make a lot of money um, and get a lot of status for, frankly, pretty cushy jobs, you know, as long as they toe the line of, of their, in this case, U.S. Uh, benefactors. So... Um, but again, the other thing I just have to add, you have the CIA, which is very active. You know, you saw that New York Times piece. They said what a lot of us knew for a long time. But now you have the Times saying that the CIA has had 12, at least 12 bases along the border of Russia since 2014, very actively involved in training um, and supporting Ukrainians in attacking Russians, right? So... Um, there's a very active presence of, of U.S. agents, both from nonprofits and from organizations like the CIA in Russia and in the area. And we'll see how, mu how, they, how much they were involved in this terrorist attack as well, especially the CIA. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, the, they're working around the clock to sort of paint this picture that that you guys have told us of, you know, the way in which the elections are supposedly carried out. It's authoritarian, all that stuff. But even just um, a couple weeks ago, the uh, World Youth Federation, you know, met there in Sochi and all these people from Latin America, all these organizations like happily went there 
and met with other comrades from communist parties around the world. And, um, you know, it's very obvious that this is just not the view of people from the global south. Um, although despite that, we're still absolutely bombarded with that same, uh, you know, that same State Department narrative on our mainstream media, even here in Latin America. Don, did you have anything to add to that? Um, just one, just one. Uh, uh, for comparative uh, number. Uh, the 77 and change uh, percent turnout compares to the highest turnout in the United States for presidential elections since John Kennedy was elected in 1960 uh, was 62.5%. And it didn't really go into 60s <coughs> only two other times uh, since that point. So, you know, this is uh, like another 25% over that. And, and uh, that is accessibility to the ballot um, and uh, turnout and transparency are really the markers of the legitimacy of an election. And in every area that I saw, and I did some deep, uh, you know, investigation into it, uh, Russia's presidential election makes ours look like, uh, you know, electing class president in eighth grade. You're still muted, Stephen. Uh, sorry, if I may, I'd like to ask, um... Dan and Don, uh, uh, a, a question about um, the meaning of this election triumph for uh, uh, President Vladimir Putin in, in terms of Russian foreign policy. For example, here we just had Laura Richardson, the uh, uh, Southern, Southern, Southern Command, US military Southern Command uh, chief, uh, issue a statement over the last few days in which she said that uh, the United States would have to be more active uh, preventing um, Russian influence in Nicaragua, Venezuela and Cuba. Who knows what that means? Um, and then as a result of this te uh, horrific terrorist attack, and here in Nicaragua we've got our flags at half-mast um, in solidarity, uh, 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 mourning with the people of the Russian Federation. In the wake of that horrific terrorist attack, um, even the disgusting governments of the European Union felt bound to send messages of con condemnation. That as, as far as I'm aware, the United States government as such has not. No, in fact, our flags are a double mass. Right. right. So yeah. My question is, <laughs> um, how do you, Dan and Don, see uh, Russian foreign policy developing, do you see it developing in a more assertive way, especially now that they are, have such a strong strategic relationship with China and Iran and a very uh, uh, good relationship uh, with India? And do you see, how do you see their foreign policy developing in relation, for example, in particular to Africa, but also to specific uh, cases like Palestine. Could, yeah. um, is that something you can talk about? Yes, and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, first of all, I think it's a bit of a back to the future in the sense that I think, uh, I don't think, I know, and, and, and th there's a, actually a white paper that the foreign ministry put out in March of 2022, which says this specifically in paragraph five of that paper on the direction of Russia's foreign policy. In paragraph five, they say that the Russia is the legal successor to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and that the two main foreign policy achievements of the USSR were the defeat of fascism, number one and two, the support for anti-colonialism throughout the world and that Russia in the 21st century will continue those two uh, objectives of the Soviet Union. And you are seeing that now writ large. You're seeing that in the fact that Putin hosted the different resistance groups from Palestine. In Moscow recently, he's trying to unite them. Um, this is something, again, that the Soviet Union would have done in the day. Um, you are seeing greater support of Russia for countries like Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela. I think that will continue and even escalate. 
Um, Africa, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you're seeing that the African countries are embracing Russia more. And again, partly because of the history of the Soviet Union in supporting decolonization there and is supporting through arms, through arming the Cubans, the overthrow of apartheid and the, uh, you know, reactionary governments in the frontline states. And um, there were a lot of African delegates in the, amongst the international observers, in fact. Um, and again, y- they feel a lot of loyalty towards Russia because they see Russia as an ally in the struggle against Western imperialism. So I think that's the direction you're going to see Russia moving in. And I think, again, they're going to be more aggressive in it now. I mean, all the gloves are off now. And I do think you're going to see a lot of similarities between Russia today and the Soviet days in terms of of how they interact with the global south, which I welcome. I think that's a very positive thing. I'll say that in Harrison Oblast, and this is very typical, you're seeing this throughout the new regions, there was um, a, uh, the flag that was raised when Russia you know, triumphed in that oblast was not the tricolor flag. It was the crimson flag with the hammer and sickle, which is still waving over the Harrison oblast, much to my great joy. And um, so that spirit of the Soviet Union continues and um, very intentionally so. And, and by the way, the people in Harrison oblast, many without prompting, spoke very positively about the Soviet Union, in particular, its goal of uniting many different ethnicities and um, cultures and nations together. So anyway, I I think it'll be a good thing for the world that Russia will be more active on the world stage in that way I mentioned. Maybe raise, uh, restate the question. It kind of. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Don. Um, yeah, the I, I, I'm just interested in what your take is on how you see Russian foreign foreign policy developing, um, uh, both in the wake of the election and in the follow up to this horrific terrorist attack, um, in Moscow. Okay, so. Uh, I think that first of all, the, the as far as the election goes, I think it's a a co-signing, a ratification, a uh, assent, you know, very deep assent by the people of uh, Russia to the current foreign policy of Russian Federation. Um, Russian Federation has been increasingly engaged uh, around the world um, within the limits of its, you know, material uh, resources. Um, and uh, we've seen, as Dan referenced, what's happened in Africa, for, for example. You know, if you look just in the context of <clears throat> what happened in Africa from uh, 2010 forward with the uh, recapture of Cote d'Ivoire in uh, December of 2010, and then the destruction of Libya and the installation of AFRICOM across the African continent, a number of governments that were tipped one way or the other, recognizing there's new power relations that existed. It's rather remarkable that in a dozen years or so, you have a mass uh, ex- exodus out of ECOWAS, um, out of the uh, Franco, uh, you know, uh, African uh, regime, um, and uh, people are getting more and more sort of South Africa uh, standing up uh, for Gaza. You know, these things. These are certainly a product of Africa's relationship with Russia because there's now a balance, and with China, there's now a balance when these countries feel that, the people of these countries feel that they can stand up and somebody's got their back. This is a direct product of Russian foreign policy, and I believe it's only going to get more assertive as time goes on. In addition to that, you have, again, I'll, I'll reference the fact it's not a small matter that there's a war by NATO being conducted against Russia on its borders. So their foreign policy had to change um, it, it to one where they did what they did. They, they, you know, they pushed troops outside their borders to try to secure their borders and to secure you know, the lives of the people in eastern uh, Ukraine against catastrophic you know, genocide. 
Um, the relationship with the BRICS countries is developing. This is a trend that we see. You know, we talk about this in Latin America all the time with the, all of the different multilateral organizations that have, you know, been sprouting up there, particularly uh, since Hugo Chavez took office in in the late 1990s. Um, and we're seeing sort of a stitching together of these patchworks of multilateral uh, entities across the globe. BRICS is one place where they all uh, get to live together. Uh, you've got the um, the, the uh, Belt and Road Project and, and a number of other things. Uh, Russia is very deeply involved in all of this. And Russia is also a key strategic partner because the United States and its allies can't just declare war militarily to dismantle this rising challenge to their hegemony because you have Russia's strategic deterrence, you know, on the side of this new trend globally. So I think Russia's foreign policy has been uh, more and more uh, independent and assertive um, and the objective conditions have required that it become even more so and uh, the election and uh, at what it evidences inside the country enables it to do so with confidence. Hi, Camilla, have you got anything to add? Well, I was hoping um, Dan sort of uh, mentioned this, but um, he said that his party is, of course, the Communist Party there. And you may have touched on this in previous interviews, but I guess, you know, we like to hear over on this side of the world because we know that leftists like to manipulate or people like to manipulate the positions of, of other parties and organizations overseas. And so what I would like to know what your understanding is of how they view in the Communist Party, the special military operation, what's going on right now and that how, how that influenced their participation in this election. Yeah, well... Yeah. It should be said that the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, while on many issues they've, it, it can be fairly said that they've kind of tailed Putin on on what he was doing. That's not true with the special military operations. The Communist Party has been the main mover of the special military operations, and I'll give a couple examples of that. First of all, they've been supporting the Donbass since 2014. They send volunteers there, humanitarian aid. The Communist Party in Donetsk, and I met with the head of the Communist Party there uh, last July, and he was saying that it was the Communist Party that organized the referendum in two four, 2014 in Donetsk, where they voted to uh, become a sovereign republic in 2014. And frankly, it's been the Communist Party that's been pushing for Russian intervention in the Donbass for a long time. And you might recall that the kind of uh, trigger for the special military operations was Russia's recognition for the first time, because they hadn't done it yet, till 2000, I believe early 2022. Yes. Um, they recognized Donetsk and Luhansk republics as independent states. They hadn't done that yet. They waited eight years to do that. But it was the Communist Party of the Russian Federation that was the party that put in the um, the bill in the Duma that called upon Putin to recognize those republics. And then once that was done, once the Duma approved that referent, that bill by the communists and Putin signed that into law and recognized those republics, that gave him the causes belli to begin the special military operations in defense of those allies, those new state allies, right? So the communist, the long and short of it is the Communist Party supports the special military operations. And frankly, if they had their druthers, they would have started a long time ago. Um, and I think the CP was right in terms of that position. I think a lot of bloodshed would have prevent, been prevented probably why? Because we know 14,000 people died before the special military operations 
through that conflict between Kiev and the Donbass, but also NATO built up, had eight years to build up the Ukrainian armed forces um, to begin this proxy war against Russia. Had Russia intervened sooner, they wouldn't have been as well, Ukraine would not have been as well prepared as they were. So in any case, that's one where that's one place where the Communist Party has really played a leadership role in the country. So, so um, uh, I, I agree with, with, with all of that, first of all. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the other parties, are, well, uh, the, the last day that I was in Moscow, what the hell was it, Tuesday, I think, um, there was a uh, sort of a conference, maybe it was Sunday night even, where the four candidates were on the stage together. Yeah, actually, it was the last night of the election. And and they all spoke, and you could tell that there was a unity there. Um, in, in terms of, uh, I mean, it's people look at this stuff skeptically here in the United States because of how much these things are bastardized and commercialized. But there was a unity there where the it, you could see an expression from the four candidates that they were interested in seeing. Russia do do good, do well. Um, you had uh, Karatanov was the uh, Communist Party candidate. Uh, you had Leonid Slutsky, uh, who was the uh, candidate of the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which is uh, associated in most people's minds that have ever heard of it uh, with Vladimir Zhirinovsky. They refer to him here in the West as an ultra-nationalist. It's a little trickier than that. Uh, obviously, though, anyone that they would characterize as an ultra-nationalist would not have a problem with the foreign policy of Russia at this point, except on the same grounds that Dan just mentioned that the CP did, which was that perhaps they could have been more aggressive about protecting the people of the eastern uh, Donbass area uh, from the Ukrainians, um, which is a separate question if you look at the actual military and tactical and material aspects. <clears throat> but they're all on the same page. And Vladislav uh, Devankov, who's a, uh, a young guy, uh, he's a member of the uh, lower house of parliament, which is the state Duma. And there's a, a construct called the New People Party. Uh, he's a business person that he helped to set up uh, four years ago. Um, he had no issues either that, uh, you know, in terms of the great issues facing uh facing the country. In other words, there was a sort of a collaborative sense looking at these four candidates that what they were doing was trying to provide uh, participation to the people uh, in the policy making um, and, uh, and have a discussion of policy publicly with this election as opposed to a horse race or a football game or whatever else people feel like they're participating in when they vote here. So thank you, Don and Dan. Um, well, perhaps we've got time for one last question. I, I, we're, we're seven minutes short of an hour, I think. Um, can we can uh, we ask you how you think Russia uh, will actually respond in practice to this recent horrific terrorist attack? And what 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 do you think they're likely to do? Resolutely. Yes, and I prob I think probably it means they will go deep into Kiev and they will destroy the Kiev regime. That's what I predict. I think that, that that's it's over. It's done. They they toyed with Ukraine enough. And I think I think they will dispatch with the Kiev regime now. So th thank you, Don. Thank you, Dan. Um, Camilla, should we should we wind up there? Yeah, that's fine with me, unless either of you had anything more to add um, in terms of analysis about the terrorist attack um, and the response. I think it's really interesting that, you know, the narrative is 
again, authoritarianism. It's that people are so unhappy with their government, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're actually seeing, because those of us who actually follow our colleagues who report on the ground there in Moscow, is people lining up at blood donation banks and solidarity and flowers, and people are grieving. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've seen. I know you guys are back home now, but you know what's really going on in the aftermath. Yeah, well, I, I saw videos from Moscow, people lining the streets in droves to both mourn the dead, but also to call for a unified response to what's happened. I Again, I my perception is you have 150 million Russians united now, and uh, the bear will strike back. There's no question about that with extreme prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I think that, uh, I think that this was a, whoever was behind this committed a huge error because it ain't going, going to go well for them. And the Russia will not take this sitting down. It will not. Don? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that, Given the uh, behavior of the government and the populace uh, over the last 14 years around what was happening in Ukraine, where the response was very deliberate, very measured, uh, very restrained, apparently, uh, by the government to the things that were happening around, like in Ukraine and around NATO and all of that, that there was criticism both in Donbass by the people who are, you know, having bombs dropped on their head every day and also by their friends and relatives and, you know, fellow Russians uh, that the, the government's moving too slow, you're not doing enough, etc. But watching how it's unfolded, it's obvious that the, the game that they played, quote unquote, and I know people's lives are involved, but the, the way that they handled this uh, affair uh, was uh, properly done from a military a strategic point of view. And so I think in terms of a response to this, that the government actually has more latitude to handle it so that the public will have some measure of trust that if even if it doesn't happen immediately, he's going to get him. So, Camilla, thank you very much for have, uh, accompanying us. Dan, Don, thank you very much for sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. We're very grateful to you. Let's hope we can do a, another conversation under happier circumstances in the near future. Yep. Love to. Thank you all. It's always Thanks, a pleasure. Guys. Be well. Good to see you all too. Okay. Take it easy. Take care. Thank you guys. Okay. Somebody has to stop recording. <laughs>